Amen. Thank you, Angie. Good morning, everybody. How are you? You well? Good. You ready for a holiday weekend? Anybody ready for a holiday weekend? Do you, raise your hand if you get the day off tomorrow. Everyone who's retired gets the day off. Anybody else? Well, good. I'm glad to hear some of you are excited. Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to today. This was one of those messages that I was really like excited, anxious to get up here and speak about. And I hope that you will be as, I hope that your experience will be as good as my excitement. So that when you leave, you weren't like, why was he excited? But rather you'd be like, that was pretty helpful. And I'm leaving this morning on a firm foundation in my faith. Like I'm leaving on solid rock. That's what I want you to feel like today. But I want to give you a heads up that this is the fifth Sunday of the month. Whenever there's a fifth Sunday, we do a missions offering. Uh, so, you know, we receive tithes and offering because we keep the mission of the church moving. Angie's doing VBS, so we need to raise 4000 This is the fifth Sunday, so we're doing a missions offering. Pace yourself. Just pace yourself. Pray about it, you know, see what the Lord would, would direct. When we do a missions offering, 100% of that offering goes to missions. Uh, generally speaking, it goes to our, our loved uh, orphanage at O'Sunny Day, but uh, it, it goes to missions 100%. Okay, are you ready? ready. Can you tell I'm excited? Good, because I have a smile. There you go. Okay, so here we are. We are taught, we're taking our time, and we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. We're in this series called The Promise. And so we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and really, we jumped right into the details. Pastor Tom jumped right into the nitty-gritty details of what the Holy Spirit uh, did in the New Testament and what he's doing Today And if you missed any of the last six messages, this is number seven, then I really encourage you to get on our app. We have an app. If you don't have it, I encourage you to get it. Listen to those messages. Write the scripture passages down. Read them in their context. You will benefit from that study, I promise. Today, I have a lot of scripture, and so we have handouts for everybody. If you didn't get one coming in, they're on that circular black bistro table out in the front. For those of you online, we'll, we'll definitely have them on our website as well. But that way you can take some notes and go back to them later because we have to go through them quickly. But here we are going through the nitty-gritty details. And so this morning what I want to do is I actually want to take a step back and sort of look at the big picture. You've heard the expression, you can't, maybe you can't see the forest for the trees. Have you ever heard that expression? You, you see all the trees and all the individual details and you're so focused on that that you don't see how big the forest really is. You can't see the forest for the trees. And so that's what I want to help us is see the big picture this morning. We jumped right into the activity of the Holy Spirit, but let's talk a little bit this morning about who the Holy Spirit is. There is a lot of confusion surrounding this person, the Holy Spirit, especially over and his activities, especially over the last 100 to 120 years with the rebirth, so to speak, of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, some things happened in Topeka, Kansas. Some things happened in Azusa Street in California. And so since that rebirth of the Pentecostal movement, there's been a lot of confusion in this sort of thing we call Pentecostal church. If you have more questions about that, you can catch me in the lobby, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. And my guess is, as we've unpacked this conversation of the promise over the last six weeks, if you've been talking with other people about this in your life groups, or over coffee, or at dinner, and I'm hearing lots of conversations are happening, I bet it's a pretty diverse conversation. Has that been your experience? Yes. Yeah, that people have very different views on the Holy Spirit and His operation and what this whole thing looks like. And so that's interesting. Here's what I want to do this morning. I want us this morning to talk about who the Holy Spirit is, and then I want to talk about the new covenant and the Holy Spirit's role in the new covenant. And really, how that affects us, and answer the question, so what? So what? And that way we get that practical piece that we can leave this morning feeling like we are on solid ground and maybe having learned some things we didn't know before. Now, it may feel a little bit more teachy this morning, but hopefully you'll bear with me, and I, I believe that you'll benefit and, and love every minute of it. So, so it's important for us to know as we begin, Christians, it's important to know that the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is God. Surprise. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is God. He is the third member, the third person of the Trinity. Now, we're generally more, more comfortable when we think about the person of the Father. God the Father, we're comfortable with that, right? And he's all through the Old Testament. Jesus references them all the time. In the New Testament, we're comfortable with this idea of God the Father. We're also comfortable with Jesus, or at least we should be, for those of us that are regular attenders and faith, that have our faith in Christ. 
We're comfortable with the person of Jesus who claimed to be God. He's all through the New Testament. In the Gospels, we recognize that he came. This is what he did and all these wonderful things, miracles. And he died on a cross and he rose again. So we're comfortable with the Father. We're comfortable with the Son. I think we're less comfortable with the person of the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Is that a fair statement? I think in general, we're slightly less comfortable when it comes to the Holy Spirit. We're a little bit more unsure. And because of this, people can unintentionally view the Holy Spirit as lesser than God. We're not really sure what to do about it. The, the Father and the Son are a lot more obvious. And so perhaps we have, because we have confusion, we think, well, does he have a personality? Does the Holy Spirit have a personality? Does he have his own will? Does he have the same traits that the Father and the Son have? Or, or does, he, does it not work that way? Is he actually another individual person? Or is he more like a force or a power? Or maybe... The term Holy Spirit is kind of this unclear application of just the Spirit of God, but not really a person. Does that make sense? Or, in fact, the King James Version translates uh, this as Holy Ghost. Not very helpful, in fact. And so it turns out there are people who have, and some that still do believe the Holy Spirit is a term for Jesus' Spirit. That's false. That's not what's on the table in Scripture. And so unintentionally, we view this relationship like this, where it's God the Father God the Son, Christ the Son, and so they're on this plane, but then the Holy Spirit is just a little bit less. Lowercase h, lowercase s, not really sure what to do with it, but he's less. But here's the truth. We dealt with this a long time ago in early Christianity. This was a heresy we put to bed in the third and fourth century called subordinationism, where they believed, there was different people that believed that Jesus was subordinate to lesser than the Father. And so we took care of that in the early church. Same thing applies to the Holy Spirit. He is equal. The Holy Spirit is God. He is co-equal. He is co-eternal with the Father and the Son. He has his own mind. He has his own personhood like the Father and the Son have their own personhood. So let's look into that. I hope I'm, I'm piquing your interest and not putting you to sleep. So here we go. Uh, since we don't have a ton of time this morning uh, to unpack each and every passage, let's just look at a few of these specifically that mention the deity of the Holy Spirit. The word deity just means God or Godhood nature. So we're going to look at passages that specifically tell us that the Holy Spirit is God. And then we're going to also just run through several passages, and there's a lot more. So if this morning you're like, wow, that's a lot, we're just scratching the surface. There is so much more. Uh, but then we're going to go through these passages that have what we call a Trinitarian formula. That means that the, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all listed separately and independently. And they do that on purpose. The writers of the New Testament do that on purpose. Okay, are you ready? Acts chapter 5. Let's jump in right there. Acts chapter 5. So we're after Pentecost. We've been talking about Pentecost the last several weeks. So Jesus has already died. He's resurrected. He's already ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit has fallen on the disciples. And the church is beginning to grow. And we read in, in this chapter that what, the, what people were doing, as so many people were getting saved, they were selling their possessions, and then they were giving the money to the church. If you feel inclined to sell stuff and give the money to the church, it's okay. I'm not going to push back on that at all. thought that would get a laugh. So uh, anyway, this is what they're doing. But there's no obligation. They didn't have to. And so one couple, Ananias and Sapphira, for some reason, they sell a piece of land and they say that they give all of the proceeds to the church, but they didn't. They kept a portion back. There's no reason to lie. There's no obligation for them to sell the land and there's no obligation for them to give the money. For some reason, they lie. So here's what Peter says, Acts chapter 5. Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? To who? To who? And to keep back for yourself a part of the proceeds of the land, while it remained unsold, didn't it remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but to, to God. In Peter's mind, the Holy Spirit is God. They are the same. Do you see that? Acts chapter 13, verse 2. While they, now this is the church in Antioch, okay? While they, the church in Antioch, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Do you see that? First person personal pronouns, I and me. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is calling and commissioning. So he has a will, he has a mind, and he's the one that's saying, here's what I want Paul and Barnabas to do. You see that? It's pretty good, isn't it? 
We're only scratching the surface. Romans chapter number 8. We continue. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So here the Holy Spirit is listed distinct from the Father, in that he prays for us according to the will of God. So therefore, he has to have his own mind in that he's able to search the mind of God. Now, this next one is a little bit tricky. Stay with me. I think you'll enjoy this. But it gets lost in English. But in the Greek, which the reason we care about that is because the New Testament was originally written in Greek. So in the original Greek, it's a little bit more clear. So the, the Gospel of John and in 1 John, well, John the disciple of Jesus, he uses a term for the Holy Spirit called Paraclete, parakletos, okay? And it means something like uh, helper or advocate or counselor. Now, in 1 John, John uses this term, paraclete, parakletos, referring to Jesus. Let's just read that real quick. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a paraclete, a helper, a counselor with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So now we don't struggle with the fact that Jesus is God, yeah? Okay, so Jesus is the paraclete. Jesus is a paraclete. He's the divine paraclete. But now in the Gospel of John, when Jesus, when, when Jesus is talking to his disciples and John is recounting this conversation that he says, he's having with them, he says this, John 14, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. This is Jesus speaking. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another Helper, a paraclete, paracletos, an advocate, a counselor, a helper, to be with you forever. How long? Forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you. Now, in John 14, 26, if, you, if you're taking notes, John 14 to 16 is such a rich passage on who the Holy Spirit is. This is Jesus talking with his disciples and the work that the Holy Spirit will do. In John 14, 26, he specifically says the helper is the Holy Spirit so that there's no confusion. But here in the Greek, there are a couple of common words that are used for another. Now, this is kind of like where we miss it in English. There's an, uh, al halos is another of the same kind and heteros is another of a different kind. But when Jesus says this to his disciples, he's saying, I will ask the Father and I will send you another halas of the same kind, another of the same kind of paraclete, another of the same kind as me. So we don't struggle with the fact that Jesus is God. And here we see that Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you another one just like me. Isn't that powerful? Right here, they, and in the Greek, it sort of stands out. Here's another point that's important. It's also important to know that John violates Greek grammar by using him and he, that second person personal pronoun. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, I didn't come to church for a grammar lesson, but stick with me. So in English, we follow natural gender. We, in our language, we don't have grammatical gender. Spanish has grammatical gender. Greek has grammatical gender. Hebrew has grammatical gender. We follow natural gender. What that means is if I say uh, something about a woman, I will say she. That's the pronoun I would use. Is that true? If I say he, man, I'm going to say he. If I say a chair, I'm going to say it. I'm not thinking about grammar. You're not thinking about grammar. We just naturally do that because that's how we speak and that's how we write. Well, in the Greek, pneuma, spirit, pneuma, pneuma, technically, is a neuter word grammatically. And so technically, and John doesn't violate grammar anywhere else in his writings. Here, instead of when he recounts this conversation where Jesus says, I'll send you the spirit of truth, and it you're not able to receive, or it will be with you, but then it will be in you. He doesn't do that, does he? He says he. And when a person reading Greek re reads this, they say, wow, why did he do this? It's intentional. It's on purpose. And he doesn't do it anywhere else in his writings. So by violating Greek grammar, we know that the personal pronoun, he and him, is important. The Holy Spirit is a person. Say amen. amen. Are you loving this? I could do this for days. I'm telling you. <laughs> Gosh, it's good stuff. Okay, here's another one. Hebrew, just one more. We only have time for one more. Hebrews chapter 10 and 15. This is one you want to lovingly share with a Jehovah's Witness and the Mormon that knocks on your door. 
Chapter 10 of Hebrews says this. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, okay, who is speaking? The Holy Spirit. The, so the author of Hebrews is telling us that the Holy Spirit said this. Then he goes on to quote Jeremiah 31. Okay, this is amazing. So now all of a sudden, he's like, okay, the author says the Holy Spirit said, let's go way back in time, some 600 years before this was written. And Jeremiah 31 says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And then the passage goes on in Jeremiah to say that, uh, that you will know me, the Lord. Now, whenever you see Lord, ca all caps in the Old Testament, it means that it's the, the, the name Yahweh, God's actual personal name, Yahweh. So do you see what the author of Hebrews is doing? He's saying the Holy Spirit said these words. So the Holy Spirit said the days are coming, declares the Holy Spirit, Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and they will all know me, Yahweh. Is that amazing? The Holy Spirit is God. For the, for the writers of the New Testament, there is no question or, or ambiguity of who is the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Trinity. Okay, so here are some Trinitarian formulas. Here are some passages that list them all out separately. And again, this is intentional. Matthew 28, 19, we know this well. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Hebrews 9, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to, to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 1 Peter chapter 1, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Not even to mention the baptism of Jesus where he is baptized and God the Father speaks and the Holy Spirit descends and all three persons are present and represented there. Okay, so here's what we've done. We've just taken a few passages. We could have spent a lot more time on them. And we could have sort of wrestled with church history and what happened. But we have established that the Holy Spirit is God. And we believe in one God. Christianity believes in one God in three persons. They are co-equal. They are co-eternal. They are of the same essence. They are of the same substance. Really, really important stuff. So now that we've established that, and hopefully we feel like, okay, yeah, we're on some pretty solid ground here thinking of the Holy Spirit as a person, just like we think of Jesus, just like we think of God the Father, so let's look at God's plan through salvation history and where we are in that timeline. And I, and I really think this is the power to change our life. This is where we can leave saying, I never thought of it that way. My life is forever changed by the power of the gospel. So scripture teaches that there are two covenants. There's an old covenant and a new covenant. Now in the old covenant for us here in 2021, we're kind of thinking Old Testament. But in the old covenant... Animals were sacrificed, and the shedding of their blood represented, represented the forgiveness of sins. And this, of course, was inadequate. I mean, if we read Hebrews, the author of Hebrews makes that very clear. If the blood of bulls and goats could have actually done anything, there would have been no need for Jesus to die. So the whole system is inadequate. But what we find when we sort of take the time to read through the Old Testament and God's plan and all that kind of stuff, we see that even the Old Covenant and the temple and the sacrifices of animals, which for us seems archaic, we see that it's actually pointing towards a perfect and an ultimate fulfillment. That's what the Old Covenant is actually doing. There's a need, something's broken, but we're pointing to a future thing where it'll be fulfilled and whole. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He comes and he fulfills the old covenant. In fact, that's what he says. He says, I didn't come to uh, abolish the law or get rid of it. I came to fulfill it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So in the old covenant, the Holy Spirit did not live inside of people. Just let that sink in for a second. The people who lived thousands of years ago, hundreds, well, over 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit did not live inside of them. So God interacted with people differently than he does today. What would happen is the Holy Spirit would de descend upon individuals for some great work 
or some great purpose that they would fulfill. I'm thinking of Moses or Samson or Gideon or Shamgar or some other people in the Old Testament that did something mighty for God because the Spirit descended upon them. And then the Holy Spirit would leave. He would ascend or however that works, dimensionally or go back to heaven or whatever. Let's not chase that rabbit trail. (laughs) So the Holy Spirit would leave, not stay within the person. Okay, the Holy Spirit lived inside the temple. The Holy Spirit lived inside the temple. When Solomon, David's son, finally built the temple, the beautiful temple, some 900 B.C., when he finally built that temple and they, they, uh, they had an opening ceremony, here's what we read. When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. So the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside the HH, Holy of Holies, of the tabernacle. Now, this little box is not drawn to scale, so I don't need to hear about this later. It's just a picture. Imagine me drawing on a whiteboard. So the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And that's why all of this ceremony and the temple was so important back under the Old Covenant. But of course, as we know, unfortunately, this, through the storyline, the Hebrews didn't serve God well. They continually rebelled. They continually broke commandments, right? I mean, I'm, we're guilty of the same. Like, we judge them like we're better. We're not. But they kept rebelling. They kept sinning. And so God's judgment, we're going to send judgment. We're going to send judgment. The prophets would say, Babylon's going to come, and they're going to destroy you unless you turn. You better turn. They didn't. And so just before Babylon comes to destroy Israel and destroy the temple, Babylon destroys the temple. Before that happens, we read this in Ezekiel. The Spirit of God leaves the temple. Then the glory of the God of Israel rose up from between the cherubim. This is part of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Where it had rested and moved to the entrance of the temple. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the city and stopped above the mountain to the east. And we see the Spirit of God leave the temple and abandon Israel to their own fate. He had warned them, and he had given them time and time to repent, but they didn't. So the Spirit of God leaves the temple, and they're on their own, so to speak. So we have God, the Holy Spirit, residing in the temple, and we have him leaving the people before the judgment and destruction, which he uses Babylon to do. But even back then, in the midst of this sort of sad story, even back then, there was hope for something new. And God would reveal in glimpses that something better was coming. I have a better plan, or I have a plan that's going to be fulfilled. So back to Jeremiah 31. We kind of, this was the reference from the book of Hebrews. This is what happened. Jeremiah, he lived through the destruction. He he was in Israel. Babylon comes and destroys the temple, and then Jeremiah ends up in Babylon. So he lived through that. And he says this as a prophet. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. A new covenant. You see that? Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. A new and better covenant is promised. So now let's fast forward. We're fast forwarding a long time, hundreds of years, almost a thousand years or so, well, 600 years. And then we're sitting with Jesus. Jesus is just about to be betrayed and arrested. He's sharing his last supper, his last meal with his disciples. It's Thursday evening. That evening, he's going to go down to the garden. He's going to begin to pray, and then the soldiers are going to arrest him. Judas is going to betray him, and he'll be crucified Friday morning. We're right at the end in in this passion narrative. And so in Luke 22, here's what Jesus says. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup. After he had eaten, and he said, this cup is poured out for you. That is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is a shifting moment. This is a paradigm shifting, world changing. Even for us, this changes the world. Jesus is saying, by me shedding my blood, I'm instituting that new covenant. And no doubt, these good disciples who were raised in the Old Testament scriptures would have been thinking Jeremiah 31. The new covenant? Is this what Jeremiah was talking about? A new covenant, what does this mean? So a dramatic shift 
in history happens right here and it affects us because of Jesus' death and resurrection and the institution of this new covenant by his blood, God the Holy Spirit does not dwell in a building making it a temple. He lives inside of you and he lives inside of me making us the temple of God. I mean, just let that sink in for a second. Let that sink in for just a second. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 6, Paul tries to make this clear. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And he says the same thing in chapter 6. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So here in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit descends, comes on the inside of us and is with us for how long? Forever. Jesus said, he will be with you forever. Man, that's amazing, isn't it? We have a relationship with God that the Old Testament saints did not have. I hope that we can see the blessing and the privilege that it is that we get the Holy Spirit inside of us. And perhaps for many of us, we've just sort of been oblivious to this. I've never thought of it like that. Or I guess I didn't recognize it like that. We would maybe say, I wish Jesus was with me. The disciples were so lucky because they had Jesus with them. I wish, I wish that Jesus could be with me. But we have to remember, in John 16 and 7, Jesus said, listen guys, in this same long conversation, it's to your advantage that I go away because if I don't go away, the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, will not come. But when I go, I will send him to you. And we have to ask, it's to our advantage that you go away? What could be better than the presence of Jesus with us? But Jesus is saying, no, it's to your advantage that I go and I will send the Holy Spirit who will be with you and will be in you forever. Man, that's life-changing. We have the power of God, God the Holy Spirit in us to live this life out, to bring God's kingdom here, to make a difference, to rule and reign, like we talked about in the previous Garden City series, rule and reign with God inside of us, leading us. It means, what does it mean? It means we don't have to try to live this Christian life out of our own strength and our own power and try to strive and achieve but we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we practice what Paul talks about in Romans 12 where he says, listen, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God that you would present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We put that into practice. We continually get off of our throne and allow the Holy Spirit to be on our throne. And man, we live an abundant life. It's an adventure. It's a life worth living with God. We submit ourselves to God. Maybe that means that in the morning we have to silence ourselves and be still and sit in a moment where we're just, God, what do you have for me today? I want to submit this day to you. I submit my life to you. You sit on my throne. Holy Spirit, lead me today. You know, where we, we sort of intentionally make that step to get off of our own throne and allow the Holy Spirit to sit on the throne of our life. Because when we try to live this Christian life out of our own strength, when we just grit our teeth and try to do what we think is right or what scripture says to do is right, it reduces itself to either legalism or grinding self-effort. Neither one of those are good for you or for other people. It just doesn't work that way. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, refilled with the Holy Spirit and just let him live his life through us. And the evidence of the Holy Spirit is fruit, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We grow in that evidence. You guys with me this morning? Okay. Ushers, if you would, while I try to land this plane, go ahead and get ready to receive the missions offering. You're welcome to give on push pay as well. You can give here as the ushers come by. Or you can give on push pay and mem memo at missions offering. So the Holy Spirit is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Son. He is God. We believe three in one. And because of what Jesus did in his death and resurrection, instituting a new covenant, man, we live really with the presence and the power of Jesus because they are one. So yeah, Jesus is with us. Yes, the Holy Spirit is in us to live through us. God, 
fully God inside of us. That's amazing. This is the promise, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, this new covenant that God, the Holy Spirit, would live inside of you, would live inside of me and fulfill his plan on earth through you and bring God's kingdom to earth. Ushers, go ahead. Yeah, you can, you can begin. Man, that's amazing as I think about that and I begin to unpack some of these doctrinal truths that we believe. How can we not fully trust and rely upon the Holy Spirit in such a way that we say, yeah, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I need him in my life fully and 100%. Like we talked about last week, yes, the Holy Spirit is a part of the salvation process. When I put my faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit regenerates my spirit. But there's just that filling. There's something different and else. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your spirit. I want to get off my throne and put you on the throne of my life. Live this through me. I want all of the gifts and operations that you have to live through me. This is power. Romans chapter 8. Paul says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Man, and just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies the same, by the same Spirit living within you. Do you feel empowered when you read stuff like that? Knowing that we have what all of the historical Old Testament saints did not have. We have God, the Holy Spirit, living inside of us. Man, what a, what a life-changing truth. Let us always be filled and refilled, not because he leaves us, of course not, but because we're trying to dethrone our own pride and ego. How can we not fully rely on the presence of the Holy Spirit in us each and every day? How many here would say, yeah, I need victory in my life in some areas? How many would say, yeah, man, I need victory over over selfishness or pride or greed, you know, addictions. Maybe some of us are struggling with addictions. Maybe some of us are struggling with these bad destructive habits that we find ourselves in this cycle or anger. Or I just need help enduring this struggle. I am in a very difficult time. I'm struggling with depression or loss or grief or, or whatever it is. I need help through the struggle. The Holy Spirit is with us. He's in you, in me. He helps us get through life's difficulties. Maybe you're having difficulty in relationship and you're like, yeah, I just need help. Holy Spirit, I need your help. God, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. I want to invite you then to come up as soon as we finish praying. You can come up and there'll be people up here to pray with you, even to pray refilled with the Holy Spirit. Begin to speak in tongues. See those power ministries. See the boldness and the confidence that the Holy Spirit brings. With God, the Holy Spirit inside of you, there is nothing, nothing, nothing this world can throw at you that would deter you. Lord, we thank you so much that you love us so much. Jesus, you instituted a new covenant through your suffering, through the the brutal beating that you had to endure, your death, but yet your resurrection power. Because of that, you instituted a new covenant that, Lord, maybe we have been oblivious to or haven't really thought through, but thank you that you did that. Thank you for the new covenant. God, thank you for your master plan. Thank you that we get to be beneficiaries of living in this day and this time on this side of the cross. I pray that we would boldly proclaim your love, boldly proclaim your healing and your life-giving power through the Holy Spirit that is available to all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here. Again, there will be people. Jeff's up here. There'll be people up here to pray with you. And man, walk in power. Take some time to refresh those scriptures and we'll see you next week. God bless you.